starting off with the bumper again. Okay. All right. Welcome to Pre-Tower with K&M Technology Group. Here we will have discussions and presentations with technical specialists <coughs> on topics or problems that are affecting the drilling industry today. We strive to keep the discussion strictly technical with no sales pitches for products or services. But since we are conducting a technical discussion, for context you should know who we are and what we do. K&M is an engineering consulting firm that specializes in complex and challenging wells. We began with a focus on extended reach wells and have evolved into a company that handles any type <coughs> of challenging wells, be it unconventional, HPHT, deep water, deep TVD wells, and more. Our highly trained team provides engineering consulting, training and best practices, and field supervision. We also developed ERA, our proprietary torque, drag, hydraulics, and geomechanic software, which makes well planning more accurate and efficient. To learn more, please visit our website at www.kmtechnology.com. All right. Um, not, not that. <laughs> um, w welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Pre Tower with KM Technology. Uh, I am your host, Mitch Abba Hussein. Uh, I'm the engineering manager at KM Technology. Uh, this is our third episode of Free Tower with K&M, so we've gotten good feedback. We're continuing to do them. We already have something lined up for next month, and we will continue to plan to do them the third Friday of every month. Uh, we had some technical difficulties last month. We started off with a little bit this month also, so we're a little bit late, so for, forgive us. Um, and uh, we tried. We decided to make to complicate it a little bit more uh, this month also. So, uh, I am here in the studio with, uh, Mike Bosch, um, and he'll introduce himself in a minute. And we also have the esteemed, uh, Patrick Wong in Abu Dhabi, uh, and he's streaming in live from, from Abu Dhabi and he's going to be presenting. So I'll let Mike introduce himself first and then we'll kick it over to Patrick. Well, my name is Mike Bosch with uh, k and I'm a senior ERD advisor, um, which is more uh, position, more focused on the execution side of things. So most of my time is spent on the rig, but happened to be in town and thought I'd swing by the studio to check out what you guys are doing. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And uh, Patrick. Hi, uh, my name is Patrick Wong. Uh, I'm a senior drilling engineer with KNM, and my job is more on the uh, engineering or design uh, part of the uh, KNM uh, services. Anyway, um, usually what I do is uh, uh, I look at the difficult wells or it's very challenging wells and try to come up with solutions uh, to help the client to drill the well successfully. Perfect. So Patrick is going to be, uh, he's the one that's going to be presenting. This is a project that he worked on with a client, so he gets to present it. Um, I will, the, the, the way that it's working is the presentation is here in the studio. So I'm going to have to control the present, presentation and Patrick will be presenting. So you might hear him say advance, advance, advance. And that's the reason why um, we need to get the presentation on the main screen. There we go. All right. Um, uh, good day, everyone. Okay, the, uh, today's topic is uh, swap management uh, more than uh, just a well control issue. Uh, when we talk about swap, most of the people are really concerned about swabbing an influx into the well when they are pulling the BHA out of the hole or picking up casing or picking up a liner. Uh, but aside from uh, the dangers of swabbing an influx out of the hole, sometimes even though we are not swabbing below the pore pressure, uh, it is actually quite detrimental swab in terms of uh, swab can actually induce well bore instability. So in this particular case, we are going to look at uh, um, a case study here that an operator uh, got a 7 and 5 8 liner stuck uh, despite no problem when they're drilling the well and no problem when they're tripping out the uh, drilling BHA, uh, but the liner itself was stuck on the way in. So after the analyzing the, uh, the available data, we concluded that the swap was the uh, main issue that caused the uh, liner or swapping in well bore instability was the main reason that the liner failed to get down to bottom. So let's take a look at um, <clears throat> the well. 
uh, a little bit of background information. So this particular operator is uh, somewhere in Europe. They are on an infield drilling campaign. So this is on a very matured field. So on this field itself, there are about 90 wells drilled and 70 of them are platform wells and about 20 of them are subsea wells. So in the well of interest, uh, we are <clears throat> the uh, like um, sorry the operator here is actually running a sand five eight pre drilled liner, but the pre drilled liner was stuck uh, significantly off bottom despite no problem drilling the eight and a half inch by nine inch hole and tripping out the drilling BHA. So obviously uh, <clears throat> the partners really want to pull the plug because this is actually they are already on the first side track when they drill the eight and a half inch by nine inch hole. Reason being on the original hole, the nine and five eight casing failed to get down to bottom. So on side track one, the nine and five eight went down to bottom, but in this case, the sand five eight failed to get down to bottom. So if you are the partner, obviously you are quite anxious because you spend a lot of money and there's no production yet. Let's take a look at the value of this particular well. Uh, the targeted or planned uh, production rate was about 5,000 barrels of liquid per day. Let's say oil price is at $45 per barrel. That is a $225,000 per day division. And let's say if production rate can be sustained for about 100 days, we are talking a value of about 22 and a half million. So in order for them to proceed or decide to proceed or not, they need to get to the bottom of what caused the sand 5 feet liner fail to get to bottom. Because if you're trying to do the same thing, obviously <clears throat> the same you can end up with the same result. The sand 5 feet liner can still uh, fail to get down to bottom. Uh, we got involved because this particular operator, they don't have a clear idea at that point in time what caused the sand 5 feet liner fail to bottom. Next, please. So in this particular case, after we analyzed the data, the findings of the stuck sand 5 feet liner were presented to the partners and we had a long discussion on what caused the uh, liner fail to get down to bottom and then what can they do on the next side track to ensure that the, uh, the issues uh, will not recur. And after that long discussion, the partners agreed to, uh, to move forward with the uh, sidetrack too. And the rest they said are history. Okay, next please, or the next slide. Okay, let's take a look at the, um, the uh, profile of the well here. So we have a very uh, simple well path, but it's quite high uh, tangent inclination. In fact, there are actually three well balls here, like I mentioned just now. We got an original hole, side track one, and side track two. A TVD of the well is around 16,500 feet, at TVD about 6,500 feet or so. So if you take a look at the azimuth uh, plan view plot, we can see that the, the blue path is the original hole. They drill to 12 and a quarter inch TD, but the 958 line uh, casing failed to get down the bottom. So they did a side track, side track one. On side track one, the nine five eight get to bottom, but the sand five eight liner failed to get to bottom. So this is a stuck sand sand five eight liner. They have to do a lot of remedial work just to retrieve uh, the liner or whatever they can retrieve, and then they have to mill a window on the nine five eight casing for the side track two. Uh, next, please. If you take a look at the, uh, the inclination of the well, which is the plot on, on the right hand side, you can find that the uh, inclination in the 12 and a quarter inch hole is quite high, 78 degrees. And then in the eight and a half inch by nine inch section, the inclination is up to about 80 degrees and then eventually horizontal. All right, next please. If you take a look at the uh, casing design, uh, the casing design is uh, quite simple in a sense that we have a 13 thread casing set quite shallow and then a long 12 and a quarter inch section and then we run a 10 3 quarter by 9 5 8 uh, casing. The 10 3 quarter inch casing is just to accommodate the safety buff. And then we have the uh, sand 5 8 pre drill liner in the production interval. Next please. All right. So when we have a stuck casing or stuck liner, liner, obviously we need to look at like, was there any problem when they're drilling in terms of hole cleaning? So uh, the plot on the left hand side here, it's the drag plot uh, when they are drilling the well. So that on the Y axis and on the X axis is the surface hook load when they are doing their top and drag on every connection. 
So in this particular case here, the red line, which is the pickup, and the blue line, which is a slack off at different friction factor from 0.05 to 0.25, the actual hook load when they are drilling the well is not showing any diverging drag trend, which means that they are not drilling faster than the hole cleaning system can cope with at that particular ROP. Next, please. <clears throat> Pretty much similar uh, story with the torque, uh, torque friction factor trend as well. So in this case here, the torque friction was tracking around friction factor of 0.15 and then it's show not showing any diverging trend. Next please. Okay, uh, this one here is the uh, thermal modeling. Okay, uh, so the uh, orange line here is the uh, geothermal temperature uh, or static temperature profile. And the red line here is the model downhole bottom hole circulating temperature the red dots is the measured model uh, downhole circulating temperature whereas the blue dots here is the flow line temperature so in this case here the thermal model actually matches pretty much uh, pretty well with uh, with the measured data next please excuse me patrick can you uh, yes. explain why temperature matters um why do we care what the bottom hole pressure or temperature is and how does that relate okay. to, to swab Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, bottom hole temperature is quite important because the mud weight itself is actually a function or the mud density is a function of temperature and pressure. So if your hydraulics model doesn't account of the uh, doesn't account the uh, temperature effects on the mud density, your mud, depending on how you measure it on surface, can be much lighter or much heavier downhole than what you expect. So, uh, in order to get to know what is the uh, equivalent static density when we are drilling the well or when we are tripping. So we need to get the thermal model correct. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Right, thank you. Okay, next piece. All right, uh, the next one here is the model standpipe pressure. So in this case here, uh, on the eight and a half inch by nine inch hole, the flow rate used was somewhere around 480 GPM. It's not exceptionally high, but it is good enough to clean the hole. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, model standpipe pressure, which is the green line, and the measured standpipe pressure, which is the uh, red dots here, the model is actually matching it very, very well. So just now, uh, Mike mentioned that the thermal model, so not only the thermal model affects the density of the mud, the thermal model also, or the temperature itself, also affects the mud rheology under downhole condition. So in this particular case, we know that our thermal model is actually very good and it's such that the, um, the standpipe pressure is also matching. Next, please. But what is more interesting is actually on the ECD side of things. So let me explain this plot a little bit. So on the y-axis, we have the depth of the well and on the x-axis, we have the equivalent mud weight in terms of pounds per gallon. Uh, the black line here, black solid line, it's the surface mud weight, which is around 11.8 pounds per gallon. And then we have the uh, pink line, that is the model ESD, equivalent static density. Essentially, what is the mud weight felt at the bottom of the hole? So in this case here, the mud weight felt at the bottom of the hole is a bit higher than the static mud weight. So this is effectively what is the well sees when there is no circulation. Okay, and on the modeling side, there's still two lines, the blue line and the green line towards the right hand side. Uh, those are the model ECD. The uh, blue line is assuming the hole is clean and the uh, green line is with ROP, with cuttings load on it. Okay, uh, there are a couple more lines here, the limit lines. So the limit line here is either the pore pressure or the collapse gradient. So in this particular case, the collapse gradient or breakout gradient, which is the green, green shaded line on the left hand side, that is what is the mud weight required to maintain ball stability. If our mud weight or equivalent static density falls below that line, then belt wall, well ball stability may occur. All right? And towards the right hand side, there is another limit line. In this particular case, that's the losses gradient or minimum horizontal stress. If we go above the uh, uh, minimum horizontal stress, then losses would occur. 
So this particular operator is quite uh, conservative in a sense that they set um, an ECD limit themselves, which is slightly below the minimum horizontal stress. So they set a limit about 13.4 pounds per gallon. And in terms of the, uh, mo uh, the measured data, so the measured data is actually matching the model pretty well, or the model is matching the measured data pretty well. So in this case, we can see that on ECD, it's almost a perfect match. On EFD side of things, which are the black dots measurement by the PWD2 in the drill string when they are drilling the well, we can see that the black dot is, or the EFD value measured by the PWD is slightly higher than the model. But this has something to do with how they're doing their talk and drag. So in this particular case, the operator was doing their talk and drag with some circulation. So therefore the ESD value, when it's being pulsed up, you only get three numbers. So in this case here, it's showing something slightly higher. Okay, uh, next slide please. But having said that, you notice that the initial dot, the first point of the ESD was actually taken without uh, circulation when they are doing their talk and drag. So just now it was slightly not matching. But what if the downhole mud weight was slightly higher than what was reported in the mud report? Let's say in this case, the downhole mud weight or the surface mud weight, I should say, is 11.84 pounds per gallon rather than 11.8. So in this particular case, if the mud weight, surface mud weight is 11.84, we get a better match in terms of ECD and also in terms of EST. Okay. So we suspect that the surface mud weight is actually slightly higher than what is being reported. But in any case, no losses was encountered because we have not exceeded the minimum horizontal stress. When drilling the well, even with the, uh, during the connection, the ASD is higher than the uh, collapse gradient, so there is no well bore instability reported. Next, please. So let's take a look at what happened when they TD the well. Okay whether they actually clean up the hole before they start to trip. So in terms of uh, after they TD the well, so what the operator did is the red shaded area here, they circulate the hole clean. In fact, they spend about six hours of circulating the hole clean and all the circulation is done at more than 120 RPM and the flow rate about 500, 480 to 500 GPM, which is actually pretty good for hole cleaning uh, with a string of five and a half inch by 10,000 feet of five inch drill pipe. Uh, <clears throat> the six hours is equivalent to about four bottoms up. So by the end of the six hours, the shakers were already clean and then they start tripping out the hole and then they pull out the hole until on elevators only without pumps, without rotations until they get back to the previous casing chute. And you can see from the uh, time lock here, tripping out uh, on the hook load side, which is second track uh, from the top, the hook load is actually pretty constant, uh, essentially showing that they didn't really have a lot from tripping out. So when they are inside the uh, casing shoe, they circulate again, and then after that, they <coughs> pull out, continue pull out hole on elevators. Next, please. Which, uh, yeah, okay. So this is the uh, model on how many bottoms up in theory required to clean the hole. So according to the model, it takes about four bottoms up to clean the hole. And lo and behold, they've circulated four bottoms up. So <clears throat> we know that the hole is clean when they are pulling out hole. Next, please. All right, let's take a look at the ESD before they start uh, tripping out. So this is the same, uh, this is the e PWD time log showing the same time section on when they are circulating the whole clean. So we can see that the ECD, which is the lowest track, or the third track uh, from, the, uh, from the top, the blue dots are the ECD, uh, sorry, yeah, ECD value, and the red dots are the ESD value. Uh, Mitch, can you click once? All right. So we can see that when during connection, uh, when they are circulating, uh, obviously they don't want to circulate six hours at the same spot, so they rack back the stand about every hour or so. So during the connection, when they are racking back the stand, we can see that the ESD value is around slightly less than 12 pounds per gallon, which is actually very close to the model ESD based on a mud weight of a surface mud weight of 11.8 pounds per gallon. Another click this. Okay, 
So the blue shaded area here is the flow check before they start pulling out or hold on the elevator. And we can see that during the flow check itself, the ESD, it took quite some time to stabilize, right? Uh, but nonetheless, the ESD does stabilize at around 18, sorry, 11.9 pounds per gallon. Again, which is very close to the model ESD. Next, please. Then we look at their trip out drag plot. So we have two sets of data from this particular operator. Uh, one set is from the mud logger, which is the black dash line. And then the other set of data is from the uh, MWD, which is the blue dots. Okay. So this is the drag plot as they are tripping out hole. On the Y axis is the depth of the well. On the X axis is the hook load. And then the red lines are the uh, hook load, model hook load based on different friction factor from 0.05 all the way up to 0.25. So initially at the bottom, they were back reaming out or circulating. So all the uh, friction factor lines are sort of bunched up together because they are circulating. So at around 15,800 feet or so, they start tripping out. And we can see that uh, initially, I mean, like there is no divergence in drag trend when they are pulling out in the open hole. The previous casing is around 13,150 feet or so. so at the previous, inside the previous casing, they circulated, and then after that, they tripped. So um, inside the previous casing, when they're tripping, we can see that there may be some diverging drag trend, okay? Depending on, actually, it doesn't really matter how you look at it uh, or which set of data you look at it, the black, blue dots or the black line, both of them are actually showing a uh, slight diverging drag trend. Um, <clears throat> well, this could be a re I mean, like the reason for, for the uh, drag trend to diverge, it could be because the hole was clean, but there is still some residual cuttings bait in the hole, uh, which is causing additional drag when they are trying to trip out. Why they don't see it in the open hole? Because the open hole is actually under read. So the BHA is six and three quarter inch hole, the open hole is nine inch. So they are not seeing this, but inside the nine and five inch casing, uh, the clearance is tighter, so they may, if there is some uh, residual cutting speed they left behind, they may see some diverging drag trend. But nonetheless, the BHA trip out without any issue. Okay, so let's zoom into the open hole part. So just now I mentioned that the open hole was quite uh, <coughs> smooth tripping out. Oh, uh, we have a question. Um... Mm -hmm. so one of the from the audience members um it takes a long time for four sure. bottoms up lots of lost time why wouldn't the mm -hmm. uh, operator use a hydro clean type of product to reduce the cleanup duration um yeah well if you look at it four bottoms up is not really a long time fair enough it took six hours uh if you use hydro clean drill pipe you may reduce, assuming that the uh, you use a significant or the appropriate uh, number of hydro clean drill pipe, uh, <clears throat> you may reduce the whole cleaning time from six hours to say three hours or even four hours. But you will need to spend time, pick up the hydro clean drill pipe. Uh, remember that if you use hydro clean drill pipe, it's not about using one joint of hydro clean drill pipe. You need to place the hydro clean drill pipe in the high angle tangent section. Mm -hmm. So on a well that is say about 16,000 feet, you are looking at maybe about 100 joints or even more than 100 joints of this hydro clean drill pipe. So if you save three hours by using the hydro clean drill pipe, you may actually spend more time, more than three hours in picking up the hydro clean drill pipe. So from a cost benefit point of view, the hydro clean drill pipe may not be the best solution here. Um, also, there is another concern with using the hydro clean drill pipe. This is an eight and a half inch by nine inch hole. If we use hydro clean drill pipe, the bigger OD of those blades on the hydro clean drill pipe may add to more ECD. And if you remember, we looked at the ECD plot just now, the ECD were close to the limit they set themselves. So I mean, if you use you, a lot of hydro clean drill pipe here, you may actually exceed that limit. And that you'd have to use them not just in the open hole, you'd have to run them all, it would be on all of your high angle section, which would mean a lot of hydro clean inside, inside the casing where it's, it's not even mm -hmm. under reamed. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, 
For, for all I know, maybe it's somebody that's promoting HydroClean that posed that question. So I don't want to poo-poo any, a, any idea. There, there is advantages to running HydroClean. It will help improve cleanup time. But like Patrick said, it costs money. You have to pick it up and whatnot. Um, I think the, the, the part that, that, that bothers me about that question is the lots of lost time. We, we have a tendency to think that um, – cleanup time is considered and and i understand that maybe it was it was you know not technically like how you would report lost time on a daily report but people do think of cleanup time as lost time because you're not drilling and you're not tripping so it's like you're not doing anything but you know people are patient when they're drilling they're monitoring ecd they're trying to keep it below a certain limit and then and then people tend to be very careful on the trip out but the critical time where you need the most amount of ta- patience to make the rest of the operation go well is the, is the cleanup time. So d- don't uh, don't think of cleanup time as lost time is what I'm trying to get at. All right, let's get back to the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> well said, Mitch. All right. Uh, okay, so I was saying that um, on the uh, trip out in the open hole itself, so the uh, mud loggers data is actually a very high frequency data. As you can see here, we actually can see, uh, Mitch, can you advance it a bit? Sure. Okay. So let's take a look at the shaded area here. Okay. Um, on the shaded area, we can see that uh, there are three area or three depths where there are some flickers on the Martin Decker. I mean, obviously, I mean, like, if you're a company man and you look at this drag chart here or the way that it tripped out, I would say 99% of the company men will be very happy with this sort of trip. Essentially, you do not have to work the pipe. As you pull out the hole, there may be a flicker or two on the Martin Decker, and this flicker are all less than 20,000 pounds. So nobody would have thought that it would be a concern in these particular, this three particular interval, all right? Uh, if you look at the other set of data, which is uh, um, the blue dot, which is a bit less uh, high, high frequency, they don't even show up as overpool at all, all right? So it, it, what I'm trying to say here is the trip out hole is actually really, really smooth. All right, let's take a look at the swap ECD when we are pulling out hole or trying to pull out hole. So again, uh, the, on the left-hand side is the swap ECD plot felt um, as seen by the PWD2. On the y-axis is the depth of the well. On the x-axis is the equivalent mud weight. So in this particular case, with 11.8 pounds per gallon mud, the colored lines are the swap ECD at different trip speed from 10 feet per minute to all the way to 50 feet per minute. So it doesn't really matter how fast or how slow you are tripping out or pulling out. It seems like our swap will be somewhere between 11.2 to 11.3 pounds per gallon. Okay which is much lower than what is required to maintain well bore stability, uh, which is around 11.6 pounds per gallon. <clears throat> the question is, this is a model. Do you believe or do you trust your model? All right. Well, <clears throat> that, is, that would be actually a very good question. Okay. To know whether your model is actually accurate or not, let's compare like, what is being measured by the PWD2 as it's being tripped out of the hole, okay? So this time we have the plot here, which is with the PWD uh, recorded data after uh, the BHA is out of the hole, we download or they download the data. And after that, we looked at the, uh, the data. So the black dots are the swap ECD as felt by the PWD2 as is the BHA is being pulled out of the hole. The green dots are the swap ESD felt by the uh, PWD2 or measured by the PWD2 as the BHA is being pulled out of the hole. The green line uh, or the uh, light bluish green line is the modeled ECD as the BHA is being pulled out of the hole. And the pink line is the model ESD as the uh, BHA is being pulled out. So we can see here that the blue black dots actually matches with the uh, bluish greenish line pretty well. Okay. The bigger problem here is actually on the pink line and the green dots or light green color dots. So in this case here, the ESD itself is not matching, but the ECD is matching, all right? So this is pretty darn good match in terms of the swap ECD, okay? Um, just now we mentioned that 
on the ECD, uh, drilling ECD, the mud weight could be slightly higher. Mitch, can you advance? Okay. If the mud weight was 11.84 pounds per gallon that we suspected, then we can see here that the ECD or swap ECD as the BHA is being tripped out, it's a complete match or total match compared to the model. So the model, I mean, like we have good confidence in terms of the model. But the big question right now is why does the green dots doesn't match the pink line? In fact, it's quite a significant divergence from the pink line. Um, this particular plot is measured by, as seen by the PWD2. But if we want to know like what is the swap ECD fell at the bottom of the hole, then we need to run a gauge type plot. Mitch, uh, next plot, please. Patrick, I had one question. So yes. while drilling, the uh, PWD tool measured an ESD that trended higher than the model. And then mm -hmm. during the trip out, that trend flipped and the measured ESD while racking back stands on connections trended lower than the model. Do you have any uh, explanation mm -hmm. on, you know, what, what might be causing that strange behavior? Okay. Well, just now I think I mentioned already on the uh, connection when they are uh, drilling, uh, they were doing it uh, with the pumps on, I mean, doing their talk and drag with the pumps on. So it wasn't really measuring a static um, ESD. Per se. Okay, that's why the ESD was higher than the model. Uh, in terms of why the ESD is lower than the uh, model when they are tripping out, uh, in fact, I'm going to show you on the next slide uh, why, I mean, like the why exactly is being lowered. But what we believe is, uh, is due to hysteresis of the mud after uh, discussing among uh, the KM engineers that uh, the mud itself has gelled up and then it has sort of prevented all the hydrostatic pressure being transmitted all the way down to the bottom. All right. Yeah, we when we take a, a look at the PWD block, yes. Yeah, no, we, we had a lot of a lot of back and forth internally between multiple people. Um, we, we had, I, I remember we, we discussed that a lot of the field people said that they had seen this, that this is not like a one-off case where the ESD was, was lower. And that's one of the advantages of having a bunch of people to bounce ideas off of is to come. I, I don't that what Patrick said was one of the ideas that is that the mud gels up fast, faster, fast enough that some of that reduction in pressure is actually withheld. So you don't get the hydrostatic um, to bounce it back. Um, I think that was the kind of the consensus on our on, on, on our end of why we think that that what was causing that I, I had a question about the so the um on the swab end uh we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're comparing model to actual swab um mm -hmm. and that's after the fact based on recorded pwd on the trip out is there mm -hmm. um is there a i know it's it's a topic of discussion if you're setting a trip schedule to stay above a certain swab there's always questions to whether that swab model is is valid in real time mm -hmm. so is there is there any way to 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 confirm your swab modeling in real time yeah well to uh to confirm the swab modeling i mean like um will, one way of doing it is you pull a stand at a known speed and then after that, you cycle the pumps to pump up the swap, the ESD uh, from the recorded by the two uh, up to surface. And then you would know at one point uh, what was your swap ECD or your minimum swap. So that would give you a sort of um, a confirmation of what is the swap actually seen by the PWD2 during that particular stand that you have tripped. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, obviously, if you have a uh, intelli pipe or wired drill pipe, that can make things a whole lot easier because uh, you actually can get data transmission uh, all the way up as you're trip tripping uh, <coughs> with the wired drill pipe. Um, there is also another way. I mean, like uh, some of the uh, PWD2 uh, can actually be programmed to uh, pump out or pump pulse up the entire uh, sequence of um, uh, ESD or bottom pressure during during a certain point in time, like say an LOT, 
So if you have done that, that would be great as well. I mean, like if the two is set up to capable of doing that, that would be great because after you trip a stand, you would know like versus time, how does the bottom hole pressure react? Okay. So right. it's still like cycle the pumps after you trip a stand. Yeah. Um, should we take the follow up? I think we had a couple of follow up questions to the tripping inside. Um, <clears throat> So the first one was, even though we say hole is clean, it was, we said that it was not, it had some cuttings in, in the hole. So, um, mm -hmm. so if that's the case, but we were looking at torque and drag plots to determine mm -hmm. hole cleanliness. So, uh, it says torque and drag plots are not good at determining hole cleanliness. Um, I think it's, I don't know, from, from my standpoint, at least. So one, one, one thing that we should make clear is <clears throat> anytime that you circulate the hole clean, you're not getting all the cuttings out of the hole. You could circulate for a week and there's still going to be a snail trail of dirt sitting at the bottom side of the hole. Um, whether that causes a problem or not, that depends on either you're, you're, you're tripping your BHA out of it or, uh, or running your casing and how problematic that is. The, the other question, um, I, I can't, can you just tell it in my ear because I can't I can't hear I can't read that. Rodney. Just read the question to me. Talk. I can't hear you. <laughs> Say it again. Um okay. W with good mud properties, high rotary speed, and higher pump rate. Uh, two bottoms up is plenty to clean the cuttings bed from a mud perspective, getting cuttings in the flow to move up the hole. Agree? You, you want to take this one, Patrick? If, All right. It says here with two mud properties, higher rotary speed and higher pump rate, two bottoms up is plenty to clean the cuttings bed. Well, um, yes, in a sense that, uh, Higher rotary speed and higher flow rate does not really, I mean, like it is more effective in cleaning up the cuttings, but in order to clean up a cuttings bit, it still takes time. Okay. What the higher rotary speed and higher flow rate will do is actually your residual cuttings bit thickness will be thinner than if you use a lower rotary speed and a lower flow rate. But the time required for the uh, cuttings bit to clean up. It, it is still the same regardless of how fast you are pumping or how fast you are rotating. Um, from a mud perspective, getting cuttings in the flow to move up the, from up toe to hole. Okay. Well, I guess um, I just have to reiterate and say hole cleaning in a high angle well, doesn't matter whether it's high angle tangent or horizontal, it is going to take time. Okay, it is not um, something that it's not doing anything. Uh, the movement of the cutting speed itself, it's a function of physics, how how gravity is pulling the cutting speed down or uh, <clears throat> and how fast you're throwing the cutting speed up. But because gravity keeps pulling it down, so you will still be limited in terms of how fast you can get rid of the cutting speed itself. A higher flow rate and higher rotary speed or even better or thicker mud properties. In fact, thicker mud properties is actually subjective. It may actually result in a uh, worse hole cleaning condition. So the mud property has to be just right in order for you to effectively clean high angle and horizontal hole. Um, yes, we do appreciate higher flow rate. We do appreciate higher rotary speed. But those two itself is not going to reduce your whole cleaning time. What it's going to do is reduce your residual cutting bed thickness. So in this particular case, the flow rate they are using is about 480 to 500 GPM. You may argue that it's not good enough to clean a half inch by nine inch hole. But the fact that they tripped the BHA out of the hole, okay, meaning like the, well, it was clean enough, even though inside open hole and inside previous casing, uh, in terms of rotary speed, they're using about 120, 130 RPM. That is, again, good enough to clean up the 8.5 inch by 9 inch hole. Okay. All right. Um, let's go back to the presentation now. All right. Uh, where were we? Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we were talking about the... Um, to understand, like, what is the swap ECD felt at the bottom of the hole when we are tripping out 
then the previous plot doesn't really tell us because the PWD is moving as we are tripping out. What we really want to know is at TD of the well, what is the ECD being felt at that particular depth when the BHA is at any other depth? So we need to run a different type of calculation. Uh, in KNM, we just call it a gauge type plot. So this is a gauge type plot that shows what is the ECD felt at the bottom of the hole when the BHA is being tripped out. So we said that just now that we need about 11.6 pounds per gallon mud or equivalent mud weight in order for, to maintain ball stability at the bottom of the hole. So according to this particular plot here, uh, we will need to, if they start tripping out on elevator, then they will have, they would swap in below 11 or swap below 11.6 pounds per gallon until about 8,400 feet or so. Next, uh, I'll click this image. Okay. So in that sense, if we need to pull this particular BHA out of the hole, well, we can't really pull because anytime we pull even at very slow speed, this is based on the speed they are pulling, uh, they would swap in. So they can only start pulling on elevator from 8,400 feet onwards to maintain bottom hole pressure of more than 11.6 pounds per gallon. So meaning from 16,000 feet, all the way to about 8,400 feet, they will need to back rim out the hole or pump out the hole to avoid swabbing in well bore instability. Next, please. All right, let's take a look at the swap ECD time or swap PWD recorded time lock just before they start the trip and the trip itself. Uh, one click, please. All right, so just now we mentioned that uh, during the flow check itself, the uh, ESD was around 11.8 or 11.9 pounds per gallon, which is very close to the model ESD. And we saw that on the plot just now, the swap ECD was around, uh, what is it, uh, 11.3 or 11.4 pounds per gallon. Uh, another click, please. Okay, so based on what is being uh, recorded okay that if we, we, we just focus on the uh, the third track which is the ecd track or the rate part of it we find that the swap ecd initially it was reducing but after that it was very very low especially between the time of around 8 30 to about 9 30. so that it looks like there is some divergence in the swap ecd but if you take a look at the track on top which is the first one, the depth. During that particular time, the bit depth didn't change. Meaning like, I mean, like we can see that the, the block is moving up and down, but the bit depth didn't change. So what is happening here is, it's not because that the swap ECD is diverging, but because the PWD2 PWD only measures a pressure, in order for us to calculate the ECD or ESD, we need to convert the pressure into a mud weight unit, but that conversion requires TVD. So in this particular case, because the depth is not being controlled properly during that particular time, so the uh, software or whatever software they are, the, uh, the PWD guys are using is not using the correct TVD to calculate the ECD or e and ESD. That's why the uh, ECD is showing some diverging trend between 8.30 to around 9.30. Uh, in the, at night. Uh, one more click, please. All right. So what is actually more concerning, uh, which uh, Mike asked just now, is the ESD when we are tripping out of hope, meaning during the connection, what happened to ESD? So we saw that uh, during the flow check, the ESD was around 11.9 pounds per gallon. But after tripping out one stand, or pulling out on one on elevator one stand. The ESD during connection never really returned to 11.9 pounds per gallon. In fact, it sort of stuck at around 11.6 pounds per gallon thereabouts. Uh, there are some occasion where the ESD is trying to get back up to uh, 11.9 pounds per gallon, but for most of the time, it's actually staying at 11.6 pounds per gallon. 
So just now we mentioned that it is a phenomenon that is commonly observed in smaller hole size. In 12 and a quarter inch hole, you don't really see it, but in six inch hole, eight and a half inch hole, we can see it. Um, it is not very well understood. Uh, like Mitch said, this is observed by k &M in some other wells. But let's say on other wells, they start rotation. Then we saw that, uh, then we can find that the ESD actually goes back to the uh, <coughs> ESD what what is expected of the ESD okay uh, next please so the whole point here is what it meant is the bottom hole pressure was lower than thought for longer period meaning like typically we say that well when we swap below the uh, collapse gradient it's only during that particular time when we are pulling out but during the connection the bottom hole pressure is higher but in this particular case based on the PWD date recorded data the swap or the bottom hole pressure was much lower than what is required to uh, uh, maintain well bore stability for longer period of time. Okay, so meaning like in terms of well bore instability, this is actually quite bad. Next, please. All right, let's take a look at the uh, sand five eight liner run that actually failed to get to bottom. Okay. So the blue lines are the slack off hook load model for this particular uh, sand 5 8 liner run and the red line is the measurement as uh, the, the liner is being run down hole. At first look at it, it looks quite good inside the case hole. Okay, even in powder open hole is still quite good until about 14,100 feet then they encountered some resistance and then they start reaming in. But if we take a look at it closely, okay, you'll find that the measured hook load, slack off hook load, is actually diverging from the model. In fact, it is cutting across different friction factor lines. So just now we mentioned that the BHA, when we trip out the hole drilling BHA, we saw some diverging drag trend and we say that, um, well, this could be the residual cuttings bit that is causing, causing it. So for the BHA itself, okay, the junk slot area is not too bad. And on top of that, it's a 16 and 3 quarter inch too. Uh, it's not going to be a big issue. But on this particular sand and 5 8 liner, can you imagine the amount of clearance of a sand and 5 8 liner uh, inside a 9 and 5 8 casing? It's not a whole lot of space. So that small amount of residual cutting speed is actually causing some diverging jack trend as seen in this particular case. Well, did it prevent the casing from get, uh, the line, the sand 5 8 liner from getting past the, the case? Well, it did not, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but it is something that uh, can cause a problem, but in this case, it did not cause a problem. Let's advance the slide. Let's focus on the open hole side of things. So the uh, open hole section is from about 13,250 feet onwards. So initially, they, do not, they did not encounter much problem. Uh, at around 14,150 feet, then uh, they saw some uh, uh, resistance and then they start reaming in. So the uh, model slack off uh, hook load all collapsed together because they are reaming in at uh, quite slow RPM, about 20 RPM. So the initial part of the reaming in is actually quite good as well. So no problem from 14,150 feet all the way to about 14,750 feet. From 14,750 feet onwards, then we are seeing significant diverging drag trend in the hook load. Meaning like, well, not only that drag is not normal, probably they are pushing something or something is giving them much less hook load than it should be. Okay. If you look at about 15,250 feet, that's where the liner got stuck. They are significantly away from the normal hook load when they are reaming in. Okay. Next, please. All right, let's compare the area where they encountered the uh, resistance on this particular sand 5 8 liner run compared to the tripping out of the uh, B drilling BHA. Uh, on the first one, uh, somewhere around 13,750 feet, there is not really a lot of uh, <clears throat> resistance encountered on the liner run. But on the second area, which is around 14,800 feet to about 15,000 feet, the small flicker on the Martin Decker when they are tripping out on the, uh, with the drilling BHA caused significant amount of diverging drag trend. 
In fact, on the third area where they saw some uh, flicker on the Martin Decker when they're tripping out uh, with the drilling BHA, the liner failed to get down to bottom. So these correlated quite well. All right, next please. Not only that we are seeing diverging drag trend, we are also seeing diverging top trend. So because they are reaming in this particular liner, so we have the top data. Uh, on the earlier part of the uh, run, the top friction factor is trending around friction factor about 0.2, which is very similar to the drilling friction factor. But at the area where they start seeing diverging drag trend, the top actually increases, top friction factor actually increases as well. As well. So, I mean, like, if we look back on hindsight, can they avoid getting this liner stuck? Yes, probably. I mean, like from about 14,750 feet or 800 feet, at about 15,000 feet, they shouldn't continue running in this part or reaming in this particular liner. Um, well, the liner would not go down the bottom, but at least you do not get the liner stuck. But because they persisted, and then we can definitely see diverging drag trend, a uh, drag and talk trend. So eventually the liner was stuck. Next, please. All right, so what are the conclusions that we can see from here? So the well ball failed. Uh, we can say that the well ball failed due to insufficient bottom hole pressure to maintain the mechanical well ball stability uh, due to swabbing from tripping the drilling BHA out of the hole on elevators. And also due to very high search and swap easy to fluctuation when running in the liner. Uh, I didn't show you the, uh, the uh, search and swap of running the liner, but you can imagine that the 758 liner, very tight clearance, and what they normally do is they also do pick up weights on this particular liner run. So the fluctuation from uh, the, at the, the bottom of pressure fluctuation due to running the liner and picking up the liner actually accelerated the failure of the particular well ball. Next, please. Uh, let me just ask you a question then. If, if we're yeah, saying sure. that um, instability is mm -hmm. what caused the liner not to get down to bottom, the instability would have been caused when they started tripping on elevators, which was below those problematic zones. So why wouldn't you see, I know you showed some flickers on the Martin Decker while we're, why, usually we use drag plots to identify hole condition. So why would the pick up, uh, you know, the pick up friction factors while you're monitoring that on the trip out? Well, why didn't mm -hmm. that work in this case indicating to indicate that the hole was in in bad enough condition that the liner was at risk of not getting down to bottom okay well i mean like um well it, it's not that it didn't show up it's just that it showed up but probably that it's not severe enough for uh, people to actually take note and take action about it uh, one of the reason that why the drag trend is not significantly diverging during at those interval uh, power reason is because this particular hole is under reamed so um, the bha itself is six and three quarter even on the stabilizer it's probably eight inch or not eight inch but eight and a quarter inch uh, whereas the hole itself is nine inch because it's under reamed. so even though you have some cavings uh, breakout um, the B, I mean, the junk slot area on the BHA is so so big that the BHA itself is not seeing a lot of resistance. But when you come down with the uh, sand five inch liner, that in the in the nine inch hole, then the junk slot area becomes smaller due to the pipe is bigger, so it's more susceptible to any uh, breakout uh, to, and then it prevented the uh, liner from getting down to bottom. Okay. Um, I think we had one other follow-up question on the um, on circulating that we wanted to cover also before we go into what was changed to make it a successful well. Is there a, re is there a reduction in cleanup time when doing short cleanup cycles while drilling? Some savings uh, overall cost on drilling. I think the, the basic of the, the, the question is, is if you do cleanup cycles while you're drilling, does that reduce your cleanup time at TD? All right. Well, I guess there's still some, uh, well, because this section is actually not about hole cleaning, that's right. why we don't really talk about it. Uh, well, if you do a lot of, say, uh, intermediate uh, hole cleaning or cleanup cycles before you TD the well, 
uh, it doesn't really reduce the, uh, the overall whole cleanup time when you do the final cleanup at TD of the well. The reason being like, let's say halfway uh, on the open hole section, you do a clean up. So fair enough, you remove part of the, or a lot of the uh, cutting bait. But as you are drilling a hate, so the area that you have cleaned up will actually be filled up with cutting bait again. In fact, it will fill up to be the exact uh, height, assuming that the rest of the parameter remain constant, meaning your ROP, your rotary speed, your flow rate, your mud rheology remain constant. So after a cleanup cycle, if you still have hole to drill, you still have moving dirt, the dirt itself will not say jump from uh, midway all the way back to the previous casing chute. So it will still slowly uh, build up to its equivalent level until you get to TD and stop drilling altogether and perform the cleanup cycle. Then and only then it will clean up. So because the cutting speed thickness is the same <clears throat> at TD compared to we have drew a couple of circulation along the way, so the amount of time required to clean up the hole will still be exactly the same as before. Okay, it will not speed it up. Yeah. Okay, assuming that you're still going to drill with the same parameters. I think you know we get this question a lot during when we when we do our training, and um, I think our standard response to that is you know intermittent cleanup times there's an advantage to them, but the advantage is short lived. So in most cases we're not we're not fans of cleanup time you know intermediate cleanup cycles uh an, an example where something like that would help is if you're drilling with a motor and you're having a hard time sliding and let's say okay i'll do a cleanup cycle it'll clean up the hole a little bit i know it's a short-lived bonus but i just need to get a slide in to get a correction on my directional work so yeah you you, you clean up the you do a cleanup cycle you you're able to get your slide in once you go back to drilling then the drag trends when you're looking at your drag trends they go back to what they were and it doesn't take much time to do it so i guess uh, it's i mean like you do the, the intermediate the cleanup cycle is for what purposes if it's yeah. for certain purposes then it may it may be beneficial, but if right. your purpose is actually to speed up hole cleaning uh, time at the end of the well, then unfortunately, uh, the intermediate circulation is not going to do anything for you. I agree with that. All right. So move, going back to the presentation. Yeah. Move on. Okay. To the next. Uh, next. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the, the other conclusion that we can uh, say is based on the uh, recorded PW recorded uh, ESD CD, the bottom hole pressure was much lower, uh, much lower than required for well bore stability. And then it was much lower for longer period than expected. So in a sense that the, there is plenty of time for the well bore instability to occur with that lower mud weight. Next. And the third one we can say is despite hole cleaning was good. In fact, it was good enough to run the, uh, to pull the BHA out of the hole. Uh, it probably wasn't clean enough for the tight clearance uh, liner. Okay. Uh, as indicated by the divergence in drag trend while tripping the liner inside the previous casing. So we need to solve the hole cleaning problem or get the hole cleaner than what has been done in order to successfully run the sand 5 bit liner all the way to bottom. Uh, diverging drag trend was still observed in the open hole even when we are reaming in and eventually we are unable to get past the more severe unstable section even with reaming. Okay, so the root cause of problem, or I mean not the root cause, the, the root cause that we need to fix is actually the well bore instability. Okay, and on top of that we still need to get the hole clean enough for the tight clearance casing run. Right. Next please. So obviously, <clears throat> there are a lot of way, uh, a lot of things we can do to um, to uh, to. I mean, like on the side track too, there are a lot of things we can do trying to uh, reduce our swap ECD. So before we look at reducing our swap ECD, we need to look at what caused the ECD to be so high. Remember that the mud weight was eleven point eight pound per gallon, ECD was thirteen point five pound per gallon or thirteen point four pound per gallon. So that's more than uh, close to two pound per gallon uh, in, in terms of ECD. And it, that's only a 16,000 feet well. And not only that, it's five and a half inch by five, or five inch drill pipe and then under rim to nine inch as well. So the high ECD itself is actually caused by the geometry of the well. 
eight and a half inch old, generally speaking, you do have higher ECD uh, compared to a 12 and a quarter inch old. But, I mean, ECD fluctuation from static mud weight. But let's say we're going to run, uh, let's say we run a tornado plot to see like what ECD is sensitive to for this particular, well, let's say on the side track two, we can see that um, the ECD, assuming the base case scenario, which is still using the uh, five inch, uh, five and a half inch by 10,000 feet of five inch drill pipe, we can see that ECD is most sensitive to the rheology of the mud. So the, if the rheology is 20% thinner or 20% thicker, it can cause an ECD swing about 0.5 pound per gallon, followed by the mud weight. Obviously, the mud weight actually has a big impact on ECD, so that is self-explanatory. Uh, in terms of flow rate, you can see that here, the flow rate even from 550 GPM all the way down to 350 GPM, it, yes, it does change ECD, but by not a whole lot, maybe by 0.2 pound per gallon. Okay. Then the next one is the drill string design. So they had a five and a half inch by 10,000 feet of five inch drill pipe. So they really know that they need to reduce ECD by running the, smart, uh, the smaller five inch drill pipe. But what if <clears throat> they use a full string of five inch drill pipe? How much would ECD reduce? In this particular case, if everything remains the same, ECD will be reduced by um, another 0.2 pound per gallon. How about ROP? In this particular case, it doesn't matter you drill at very low ROP or at 160 feet per hour ROP, the ECD is not really significantly impacted by ROP. Likewise, the rotary speed as well. Okay, so if we want to reduce the ECD, okay, one of the things we can do is, or I mean, the thing to do is trying to thin down the mud rheology. Okay, second thing is trying to reduce the flow rate, and third thing is let's try to slim down our drill string design. Um, why do we really want to reduce the ECD? Because if we reduce ECD here, then we can increase our mud weight. If we can increase our mud weight, then swap become less of an issue. Meaning like we may be able to pull the BHA, uh, drilling BHA out of the hole from TD without swapping in wellbore instability or below the uh, mud weight required to maintain stability. Next, please. All right, let's take a look at a more drastic uh, solution. So what if they use a full string of four and a half inch drill pipe rather than the tapered drill string? So in this particular case, we can see that by changing the drill string design, we can actually reduce the ECD by about 0.4 pounds per gallon. Meaning if we are drilling with 11.8 pounds per gallon mud, we actually can drill it right now, or what is it? 12.2 pounds per gallon mud. So with 12.2 pound, uh, pound per gallon mud, they may be able to trip out without swabbing in below, uh, swabbing below 11.6 pound per gallon. But this is a sidetrack too. To arrange a full string of, four, I mean, of 16,000 feet of four and a half inch drill pipe may be a bit too far-fetched. In fact, they actually look, I mean, the operator actually looked for a full string of four and a half inch drill pipe. They just couldn't get it uh, in time. So the best thing they can do is actually a string of five and a full string of five inch drill pipe. So the ECD of full string of five inch drill pipe based on the mud rheology that was used on the side track one is something like this. This is a sensitivity plot against flow rate. So on the Y axis is still that on the X axis is still ECD. So the limit is 13.4 pound per gallon. And we can find that if the flow rate is about 550 GPM, then at TD of the well, the ECD would be around 13.4 pounds per gallon. If the flow rate is a bit lower, 350 GPM, then the ECD would be around 13.3 pounds per gallon or 13.25 pounds per gallon. Okay, so that is how much they can play with in terms of flow rate that can influence ECD. But you're looking at a very, very small range, less than well, about 0.2 pounds per gallon. Next, please. Let's take a look at the effect of mud rheology. Okay, so we can see that if I mean the the line in the middle is the rheology as presented based on side track one, but what if on side track two the mud rheology is thinner? If the mud rheology is twenty percent thinner than uh, than the uh, the mud rheology on side track one, then the ECD would be around thirteen pound per gallon at TD of the well with full string of five inch drill pipe. That would be great because they can increase the mud weight then. But what if the opposite is true? If the mud rheology is thicker 
than uh, on sidetrack one, then well, they may actually encounter loss circulation because now the ECD would be around 13.6 pounds per gallon at TD of the well. Okay. Since, uh, Patrick, right. yes. Since, since, yes. since there were so many questions on hole cleaning, I think we should probably address that now. Is uh, mm -hmm. We didn't get this question, but I'm thinking whoever has been asking the hole cleaning questions may, may be thinking it. When, when you thin down the mud, uh, are mm -hmm. you are you worried about that introducing a hole cleaning problem? Um, with the hole size, we are looking at nine inch or nine and a half inch with full string or five inch drill pipe. Um, as long as you can rotate 120 RPM, it may take a little bit longer to clean up, but you will be able to clean up the hole. Okay, despite slightly thinner mud rheology. Uh, typically, we want the 6 RPM mud rheology about one time the hole size. Uh, that will be sufficient for us to get the hole cleaning conveyor belt working or the viscous coupling effect working. So we are not looking about a mud rheology about like three or four reading on this. I mean, three or four degree on the 6 RPM reading. We are looking something like somewhere between seven and eight for this particular well. <clears throat> In fact, uh, on the uh, sidetrack one, I think the 6 RPM reading was nine or ten yeah okay so we are just trying to slightly reduce it okay perfect all right yeah. back to the presentation okay so uh yeah so we're talking about just now on the mud rheology side of things so thicker mud actually is bad for them thinner mud will be good uh in fact on this particular operator they actually changed the mud system thinking that a different mud system will actually give them better rheology uh, later, we're going to find that uh, the different mud system actually has higher mud rheology. So all the effort here in trying to reduce ECD such that we can increase the mud weight actually goes down the drain. Anyway, let's take a look at the swap side of things. Let's say we go with the base case uh, drill string design, um, which is the uh, tapered drill string of 5.5 inch by 10,000 feet of 5 inch drill pipe. So we can see that it doesn't really matter what we, how slow or how fast we are tripping from 10 minute slow trip speed to five, uh, 10 feet per minute to 50 feet per minute fast tripping speed. The swap ECD is going to be below 12, uh, sorry, 11.6 pounds per gallon. So essentially, if we want to pull our hole on elevator or be able to pull our hole on elevator, we need the swap ECD to be above 11.6 pounds per gallon. So in this case here, we know that it doesn't work with 11.8 pound, uh, pound per gallon mud weight. Next, please. So what if we go with a full string of five inch drill pipe solution? And so in this case here, fair enough with the smaller uh, OD drill pipe, the, uh, what do you call it? The swap ECD actually slightly reduced, but still no cigar. If we're trying to pull out, on, pull out, pull out hole on elevator with 11.8 pound per gallon mud, we are still going to swap in well bought instability. Next, please. How about with the more extreme solution of four and a half inch drill pipe? So in this particular case, yes, the e swap ECD again improved, but still below 11.6 pounds per gallon. So there's still no cigar. So what it means, like it doesn't really matter what drill string they are using. If the mud weight is 11.8 pounds per gallon, then there is only one solution to avoid swapping in well bore instability. That is by you need to pull out a hole, or sorry, you need to trip out a hole with either with uh, pumping out or back reaming out. Next, please. <clears throat> okay, so this is the solution that uh, they've used for the side track two. So instead of eight and a half inch by nine inch hole, we actually end up drilling eight and a half inch by nine and a half inch hole. So why we increase the uh, hole size from nine inch to nine and a half inch is because we want to provide more clearance just in case that we still swap in something, but there'll be more clearance for the sand five feet liner to pass through any breakout that is still in the hole, right? Uh, nine inch hole was actually quite arbitrary. Uh, so, I mean, like after looking at things, we decided we go with a nine and a half inch hole rather than nine inch hole. Does it really reduce ECD by uh, having a nine and a half inch hole? The answer is we looked at the difference between drilling a nine inch and nine and a half inch hole. The ECD benefit is actually very, very minimal. Um, 
Okay. The, the same so would be just with now I mentioned that the, the same would be with swap yeah. also too, Patrick, right? Yes. Yes. In terms of swap reduction uh, from nine inch show and nine and a half inch show, comparing nine inch and nine and a half inch show, the reduction is insignificant. And okay? that's so mainly... the main reason for nine and a half inch show is just for bigger clearance for the sand five inch liner in yeah. the open hole. So the, the, the reason right. for the, the, the minimum impact on ECD and swab is because most of it is being generated in the annulus between and the drill pipe and control. the casing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just okay. just wanted to clarify that. Yes. All right. Um, so just now I mentioned that, uh, no, just a uh, previous one. Yep. Okay. So just now I mentioned that the mud rheology, because we changed the uh, mud system, we end up with much thicker mud rheology. It doesn't really show up on this plot here, but this is the thermal modeling for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, what do you call it? The side track two. So in this case here, uh, the model still matches uh, the model on the bottom of circulating temperature, the model on flow rank still matches the, uh, the uh, actual measurement from the MWD two. Uh, on this particular case, the uh, bottom of circulating temperature is actually slightly higher than the uh, static temperature, which is actually the same case on the side track one. But in this case, it's just slightly higher. Side track one is significantly higher. Reason? Because we are using a lower flow rate here. So lower flow rate, lower pressure drop in the analyst. I mean, sorry, inside the drill string, so less heat being generated. So that's why the bottom of circulating temperature is slightly lower. So this is the ECD of that particular side track too. So we still go with 11.8 pound per gallon mud weight. And in this case here, I'm showing the flow rate. The flow rate right now is somewhere around 440 GPM. So the hole size is bigger, the pipe size is smaller, and the flow rate is lower. Yet we still manage to cap the hole clean. Uh, well, we did make some adjustments on the ROP. The previously, the ROP was on average about 60 feet per hour. So right now, on average, the ROP is 50 feet per hour. So we slow down the ROP by about 10 feet per hour. Uh, in terms of ECD, uh, <clears throat> on the model, again, you can see that initially from about uh, from the uh, 9 and 5 casing window all the way down to about 14,100 feet, the ESD is actually matching pretty well. The measured ESD by the PW2 is met uh, it's matching pretty well with the, um, what do you call that, the um, the model. And on the ECD side of things, it's also matching very well. Uh, in this particular case, the ECD is actually about 13.5 pounds per gallon. Previously, on side track one, it's about 13.4 pounds per gallon. Reason being, why is it higher? Because of the mud rheology. So if you take a look at the mud rheology here, uh, if you pay attention to, to it just now, you'll find that the mud rheology is significantly thicker on this case. So despite having a lower flow rate, despite having a, a smaller pipe, despite having reducing our ROP, we end up with slightly higher ECD because the mud rheology is a bit higher. So there is no room for us to increase the mud weight to improve our trip margin even though we have done so much work on the uh, trying to reduce the ECD. All right. <clears throat> so um, just not sorry, but don't have answer yet. Let's go back. So just now I was mentioning that uh, from 14,000 feet or 14,100 feet onwards, the ESD is actually trending slightly below the mud weight. I mean, the surface mud weight. Part of the reason is we are doing the torque and drag slightly different. We are doing it with pumps off. But because of the swap when doing the torque and drag with pumps off, uh, I mean, it's actually approaching about 11.74, so it's getting close to 11.6. Therefore, from 14,250 feet onwards, we change the way that the torque and drag is being taken. So we go back to, the, uh, to take the torque and drag with pumps on. So after taking with pumps on, because of how the algorithm is uh, being produced, uh, for the ESD to pause up by the PWD too. So we end up with slightly higher ESD compared to the model. But I would say that not because the actual ESD is high, it's just because what the algorithm by the PWD to picked up and decided to pause up. All right, next please. So this is the PWD time log for that particular well. And I'm just showing you a connection at about 14,000 feet where we do the torque and drag with pumps off. So this blue shaded area here is when we do our pickup weight. You can see that the flow rate, which is one, two, three, four, the fourth, the fifth track, 
the flow rate is zero. We pick up the uh, the pipe for about eight foot, okay? And let's take a look at what happened to the uh, recorded PWD time lock. The ECD or the ESD, I should say, dropped to about 11.74. So pick up eight feet, mud weight is 11.8 surface, uh, but the ESD end up 11.74, okay? So search and swap, I mean, swap is actually real, even though you just picked up the pipe by eight foot. Uh, next click, please. Okay, so after that particular connection, then we change the connection procedure. So we do the uh, talk and drag with pumps on right now. The blue shaded area here is we're doing our pickup weight. And you can see that this time we have about, uh, what is it, about 350 or 320 GPM on it. So we can see that the corresponding ESD is, or ECD in this case, um, is much higher <clears throat> while we are not swabbing. And during connection itself, the lowest uh, ESD we've seen is around 12 pounds per gallon, maybe 11.95 pounds per gallon. Next click, please. And also, because the uh, the mud weight is quite mud weight window is quite narrow here, so after the connection, we turn on the row tree first. Uh, so the green shaded area here is the uh, after the connection we break. Uh, we start rotation first. So the fourth track from the top is RPM is showing zero here, but because we are rotating the row tree speed at about twenty RPM, so it is not being picked up by the MWD or the mud loggers. Uh, but on the fourth track, on the fifth track, that's torque. So we know that there's definitely torque in there. So we are rotating the drill pipe. And if we look at the ECD, and then after, after we start rotation, we start the uh, breaking circulation. If you look at the ECD, there is no surge in ECD from breaking the circulation or breaking the gel after a connection. All right, next please. Let's take a look at how we trip out a hole. So just now I mentioned that uh, we either we pump out hole or back rim out the hole. So in this particular case, we agreed on back reaming out the hole because back reaming can ensure that you leave behind a almost 100% cutting free hole. And not only we are back reaming in the open hole, we are also back reaming inside the case hole. So what's the reason back reaming inside the case hole is because we want to ensure that inside the high angle tangent case so of 9 and 5 8 casing it is as clean as possible for the tight clearance sand 5 8 liner okay so we back rim the entire uh, open hole and case hole up to about 30 degree and this is the thermal model for it and again it is matching pretty well <clears throat> next please was uh, and this is the model yes um was was convincing them to rotate at a high rpm and back because we we when we when we <clears throat> recommend back ramming, we recommend back ramming with good hole cleaning parameters. Right? Because when you back ram with bad hole cleaning parameters, that's what you that's when you get yourself into trouble. So yeah. was um what was convincing them to rotate fast inside casing? I know that there's a lot of in the industry. There's a lot of pushback about rotating fast inside casing and damaging casing and whatnot. Um, did you get much pushback and what are your thoughts of whether that's myth or or, uh, or or if it's a real thing? Well, there is no doubt that a lot of people are concerned about casing where uh, when you are back reaming inside a casing. In fact, from a directional company point of view, a lot of them actually don't really want to back ream with their BHA inside the previous casing because they say shock and vibration is high, you're going to damage my two and all that stuff. In this particular case, I mean, like, <clears throat> it wasn't very hard to convince this particular operator to back ring inside a casing. Reason being, they're already on second side track. You would throw the kitchen sink in to make sure that your sand 5 feet liner go all the way down the bottom. Because if it's on the second time you try it, you still fail to get to the bottom, you may be out of a job. Okay, so it wasn't very hard to convince them they need to back ring inside a casing. And on top of that, the data actually shows that they have diverging drag trend inside the case hole. If they are so convinced that everything is going fine, then I've invited them to come up with an explanation why they have diverging drag trend inside the casing. So in order to ensure that they get 100% or 
maximize the chance of getting uh, the sand five eight liner down to bottom. So they agreed to back rim inside the casing. Uh, in terms of the directional tools, when they are back rimming, was there a lot of uh, shocks and vibration? The answer was no. The two came out of the hole almost brand new. Even though after they drilled the hole, it came out green. The bit was green. Um, did they see a lot of uh, metal swath uh, when they are back rim inside the casing? The answer was no as well. Okay, so in that sense, I mean, like they have not the the PDC bit, the, the PDC bit did not damage the casing in that sense. And I think I mean that's something that we do on a regular basis, and we've never seen a problem uh, a problem with it, at least one that I can remember. So that's why I just wanted to yeah. put it out there. Well, as long as the the uh, build section in the upper build sorry the bill in the upper section is not very high dock leak. Or else you may you can end up in a casing wear situation. Right, and if you're right. sitting in one place rotating for a long period of time, that's fine. But when you're back reaming, you're never stationary. You're always pulling the BHA up the hole. Hopefully, I mean that's the goal. So, mm -hmm. all right. So going back to the presentation now. Okay, so um, this is the model for the back reaming. I mean the, the swap ECD when they are back reaming out the hole. I mean it's not exactly swap because they are back reaming. So the uh, mud weight or the equivalent mud weight is actually above the uh, static mud weight. So in this particular case, uh, when they circulate the whole clean at TD, they actually increase the mud rheology to prevent barite sac. Okay, that is their standard practice over there. So, so the mud rheology actually end up thicker. So because of that, the swap ECD, I mean the ECD, I mean right now, instead of worry about swap, we actually worry about the ECD when they are back reaming going above the uh, the frag gradient. So in this particular case, we have to back rim at even lower parameters. We only going to bump at 400, 400 GPM. We drew it 440. Now we're going to back rim at 400 GPM and then 140 RPM. So that would be the swap ECD. Next, please. All right. This is the exact swap ECD when they are, they are back reaming out the hole and you can see that it's almost a perfect match. In terms of flow rate, they do pump at 400 GPM. In terms of how fast they are pulling, in the open hole, they are pulling a bit slower and inside the case hole, they are pulling about 40 feet per minute. So it's not slow back reaming, it's actually back reaming quite fast inside the case hole, okay? meaning about two minutes per stand and then connection. So most of the time it's actually spanned in connection. And you can see that the back rim all the way to about a thousand feet, which is about 30 degree inclination. All right, the main idea here is even the uh, on the swap ECD, you can see that during connection itself, the swap is above 11.6 pounds per gallon, or the ESD is above 11.6, so there is no chance they are swapping in any instability. So how did the 758 liner run to bottom? So this is the uh, drag chart of the 758 liner run. Uh, two sets of data. The black line is from the uh, MWD guys. The uh, red line is from uh, the pink line is from the mud loggers. So in this particular case, we can see that uh, inside the case hole, no longer they are seeing any diverging drag trend. Let's zoom in to the uh, open hole section. Okay. Yeah. So in the open hole section, in fact, there are three areas where they encounter tight spot. The first one being the window. In fact, the window having tight spot was expected because when they milled the window with the milling BHA, they have prom passing it. Uh, even with the drilling BHA, they had some prom passing it. I mean, like they, they couldn't they couldn't run in hole and pull out hole without rotation. So the uh, the first uh, tight spot around or resistant around thirteen thousand feet can be attributed to the. Uh, uh, problem with the uh, casing window, it, it, which is mechanical. Then they had another problem that uh, at around 14,200 feet, um, it's due to a high dock leak, but after they ream uh, that joint of liner into the hole, after that they can continue running in the hole. And then they encountered another uh, resistance at around 15,350 feet. So this is at the top of, sorry, this is not, this is most likely some well bore instability. Uh, precautionally, they actually rim all the way down to bottom. 
because they see they saw that the uh, the talk and drag is actually pretty behaving pretty uh, constant there was no diverging divergence in drag or talk trend next piece just a quick so question this for is, you patrick yeah uh, on this mm -hmm. so this yeah. is a, this is a slotted liner correct yes they uh, didn't run an inner string no wash pipe right so yeah. so there's really no benefit of circulating while you're reaming down right so the, the, nope. because you i mean you'd just be circulating at at the liner hanger basically um so there was yes. no circulating while they were reaming yes it's okay. dry reaming down at about 20 rpm okay just wanted to point that out because that's also something that i think in the industry people are reluctant to do is rotate casing or ream without circ circulation so just wanted to point out that this was a case where yeah. they, they did ream down without circulating yeah in fact they couldn't afford to circulate even they want to because the clearance <laughs> is so tight so ecd would have been the, ridiculous yeah the ecd would have broken down the formation so they would end up in a lost circulation situation as well correct okay going back to the presentation all right, next piece. Yeah, okay. So we are showing here the uh, reaming talk plot. Okay, we can see that the talk is actually quite normal. Uh, friction factor about 0.2. So it doesn't matter whether they are reaming at the uh, resistant at the previous casing shoe, I mean the, the casing window or at around 14,200 feet or from about 15,300 feet all the way down to bottom the top was quite normal. In fact, just now I mentioned that rotary speed was about 20. Uh, actually, I made a mistake. It's actually about 35 RPM. Okay. So they rim the last about 1,100, 1,200 feet all the way to bottom. I mean, like eventually the liner went down to bottom. Everybody was quite happy. Next, please. So one more thing that we have changed. Oh, okay. Actually, uh, remember that I mentioned that the... Uh, uh, they do a lot of pickup weight when running this particular uh, liner on the sidetrack one. So we actually change the practice as well because when we are picking up the pipe, there is significant amount of swap due to that tight clearance. So on the third track on this particular plot is the hook load plot. So we can see that the liner is being run from 4,000 all the way to about whatever, 12,000 feet thereabouts. So we can see that on the hook load, there is not a lot of spike on the hook load. This is because when to avoid swabbing when we are uh, to avoid swabbing when running in the liner, we just pick up enough to get off the slips. Meaning we pick up to the previous hook load to get off the slips, and then we are running in hope. So that's why we are not seeing the hook load having a lot of spikes. This is to avoid swabbing in any wellbore instability while running in the liner. And you can see that there is no circulation involved. There's no rotation involved until uh, this is still inside the previous casing. Next, please. Patrick, if I could interject. Uh, I really like this yeah, slide. Sure. I really like that slide, <clears throat> uh, the previous slide you have there. Um, mm -hmm. it's so oftentimes in the field, you see so much time and energy spent on managing your swab loads on trips out of the hole, whether it be conditioning the mud or waiting up for trip margin, uh, tripping speed schedules, pumping out, back reaming out. And for some reason, uh, it seems pretty common for people to forget about the implications of swab as soon as they pick up a subsequent casing run. And um, whether it be, you know, just uh, picking up past slip height um, or having a desire to pick up the string to get an up weight. Um, sometimes those, uh, the, the implications of swab and swab loads with a bigger, bigger string of pipe you know, higher swab loads than any swab load that you had previously with the drilling uh, drilling assembly. Um, so I, I just want to point out that I like this slide and uh, it seems like in the field, um, the implications of swab with your casing string are often forgotten. So, yep. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, it's just I, common for the driller to pick it, up. It, <laughs> sometimes you have to fight to get a pickup weight while drilling, but there's always a real strong desire to get pickup weights with a, a casing string. I think most people just think yeah. that because the pipe is so big that it's almost like tripping dry, you know, you pick up and the float, but there is a float shoe sitting at the bottom of the mm -hmm. string with a restriction. Right. So it's, it's not going to be like your pipe just freeze move. F the pipe moves freely and your mud is going to stay stationary. Or if if any, anybody's had the luxury of having to pull casing. <laughs> <wet>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, in yeah. fact, in this case here, the, the, this, this particular liner is full of holes. Yeah. Still, right. the swap load is huge because of the tight clearance. In fact, uh, I've, I've not pointed out, they, they actually run a diver to, diverter to above that particular liner hanger running to as well, just to avoid all the search and swap issue. Wow. <clears throat> okay. All right. Going back to the presentation, I think we just have a few slides left. Yeah, I think one more, that's it. Yeah. All right. So one more thing that we have changed is actually the uh, liner shoe selection. So on side track one, they run the uh, the reamer shoe uh, on the right uh, on the left hand side, uh, but on side track two, then we actually change it to a uh, sort of um, eccentric pilot shoe. Uh, reason being is on the junk slot area. So if you take a look at the uh, sort of um, the frontal uh, mark shot of the uh, reamer shoe. There is really not a lot of uh, junk slot area for anything to pass through, okay? But on the eccentric rimmer shoe, the, the uh, biggest OD in this case here is just 7.69. So it's slightly higher, uh, slightly bigger than your casing joint. So if any, anything is there, it's not going to prevent the uh, liner from, uh, from getting down to bottom. Next, please. Okay, in fact, I mean, like... Um, the the choice of running the uh, eccentric pilot shoe was probably a very good call because on a subsequent uh, well ball cleanup trip after the uh, the liner went to bottom they still have to clean up to run a sand screen inside the pre drill liner so on the cleanup trip uh, the uh, junk basket actually and the magnet actually collected this sort of junk from the window okay so if we have run the uh, the uh, reamer shoe that was used on uh, side track one probably the this particular liner would not be able to get past the uh, casing window so it was i don't know whether it's by good luck or by a good choice that um, we actually run a eccentric pilot shoot so i mean like um i mean this is the last slide i mean just to get this particular liner down we actually have changed a lot of things not necessarily hardware change but by changing the procedure itself uh, in terms of minimizing the search and swap, uh, controlling the ECD, uh, practices in terms of uh, like uh, picking up the liner or stop picking up the liner and back reaming out the hole. Yes, it did take a long time. I mean, take a bit of time to get the, uh, the BHA out of the hole. But the most important thing is the 758 liner went to bottom as all the way down to TD. In fact, they actually had a big flow chart on like when they can actually uh, call TD, meaning like they didn't need the sand 5 liner run all the way down to TD before they complete it, meaning like they only need certain exposure before they can, they can say like, if the liner is not going down, everything is still okay. But in this particular case, we completed the well as expected. In fact, production was as expected as well. Great. All right, that's all from my side. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you for joining in from uh, Abu Dhabi. It's late in the afternoon over there. Um, thanks, everybody that uh, was listening in. Do we have any? Do we have any follow-up questions that we need to address? Or uh, we try to limit these ten hour. We're already at it about an hour and a half. Um, normally, so uh, those that there's um, David Gibson has V door locksmith usually on Fridays. Um, he, he usually does it at 10, so we try to not overlap um, because a lot of our, our the, the viewers enjoy his topics also. So, But he's doing it later today. So uh, it's actually going to be a really good topic at 1 p.m. Central Time. He, he's going to have somebody on and talk about the economics of the industry. So feel free to jump back on LinkedIn Live and, and, and view the David Gibson's uh, V-Door, V-Door Locksmith at 1 o'clock. It should be a good talk. Good talk. Our next, um, our next uh, pre tower with K and M is scheduled for December eighteenth, and I believe the topic is going to be with uh, Mike Bosch. Uh, he, he's he's going to be discussing <laughs> some uh, really cool stuff where he, he drilled, uh, where we talked about. Um, you know, drilling efficiency and MSE on a project that we worked on. It's going to be really, really good stuff. So be sure to tune into that December 18th. Um, any other follow-up questions that we need to address before we sign off? So I'll let uh, everybody just kind of 
you know, wave, wave. Uh, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button. <laughs> Smash that subscribe button. <laughs> Smash that like button. Um, yeah, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and we will see you December 18th.